Okay, so um, welcome everybody to the Manchester Java community. Um, my name is Nick Abbey. I help organise these events, um, along with a couple of other people, Debbie Roycroft and Dunmore, who are on the call. Um, yeah, today we've got um, the Fuji Drug Tour joining us, and Simon Mitt will be speaking. I'll hand over to Kirtan in a moment to introduce Fuji in a bit more detail. But just before that, I'd just like to thank our sponsors. So RecWorks, they um, sponsor us by covering our meetup fees, essentially. Um, so I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, without further ado, hand over to here, Sam. Thank you. Well, thank you, Nick. And um, thank you all for uh, for being here. My name is Geertjan. I'm in, in Amsterdam. And um, I really do need to share um, the fact that, you know, it's kind of kind of nice for me that we're in this um, virtual uh, Manchester uh, Jug meetup because I think of Manchester multiple times a week, um, I must admit, because I'm a pretty big um, Manchester United fan. And right before all of this, I uh, purchased my um, Manchester United club card for the very first time. So I'm hoping I'll be able to get to use it uh, afterwards. Um, but um, what, what, we are, um, what we're doing is we're going around to a lot of different jugs, as uh, many as possible, to introduce a new um, community platform for um, for the Java community, which is FUJ, so FUJ.io. Um, I used to work in Sun Microsystems, where we used to have uh, Java.net, which, as you can see, no longer exists, as a um, as a collaboration information site for all things Java. And um, no longer, it not only does that site no longer exist, but also, of course, um, there are now multiple different um, vendors of Java. It's not just Sun Microsystems. Uh, it, you know, there's Oracle and there's Azul and there's BlaSoft and there's Amazon and there's Red Hat and uh, there's also Microsoft now with its own Open JDK distribution. So it kind of becomes difficult to to keep track of all of that. And what's also happened is that there are now quarterly updates to the major Java releases, which is also quite difficult to keep track of. So um, what um, Fuji is about um, primarily is to give an overview of that very diverse um, ecosystem um, and a single one-stop shop for all that information. So for example, there is um, on Fuji the Java version Almanac, which actually comes from a Java champion called Mark Hoffman, who has a site called javaalmanac.io, <coughs> which if you don't know that it exists, um, you would never visit. And so what we're doing by means of Fuji is providing an integration platform for that kind of information. So with this integration between Java Almanac and Fuji, you see the list of different open JDK distributions. Um, and when you click on, on here, you know where to find them and where to download them and so on. Um, and on the point of the quarterly updates, um, here along the top, we see major Java releases. And here we see um, the various uh, most recent quarters. And for each quarter, you can actually see what has been fixed in that quarter. And so for Java 8 in April 2020, you can see that there were 185 issues fixed. And here are those issues. And they're also organized in a component view. So you may be interested in particular in hotspot, for example, or in security. And you can take a look and see exactly those issues that have been fixed. And as you browse through that, you might find some of them really interesting, even though there might be a P4 or P3 that could still be really relevant to you, to what you're doing. And then you would click on that little star on the right there to vote for that item. And the most voted on items um, end up on the highlights page. And so the highlights page gives a community view on you know, what Java users themselves find to be the most relevant fixes for a particular quarter in a particular uh, major release. And what we then do is we provide a commentary. So you might find in the list of, in this long list, you, know, you, you find all these um, titles, a title like um, integrate Marlin renderer per JEP 265. Now who knows what that means just from that title. So we then add a commentary as Fuji. So Fuji is not only to bring together all this different information, but also to annotate that information. So here is the information that, that we've provided here. JDK 9 switched to using the higher performing Marlin renderer. This is a backport of that feature to JDK 8. So here we 
provide some context to to make this particular fix um you know to provide that information and to maybe explain why this is one of the more popular fixes for that particular update so those are two areas that uh, fuji focuses on another area is jvm command line arguments now does anyone know where to go to find all the JVM command line arguments. And do you know what is new in a particular release of Java? So here I'm looking in Java 11. So here in this tab, I have a list of what's new. So here there's 53 that are new <coughs> and there are 27 that are removed. <coughs> so I can go in here and see those um, additions and removals. Now, again, this comes from a Java champion, Chris Newland, who has a site, chriswhocodes.com. So that's kind of a similar situation to Mark Hoffman. So these are all separated sites out there that we're trying to bring together under this common platform. So once we have this kind of content, so these are the, the, the main um, reference materials you'll find on Fuji right now. And if there's more, we can always add more. It's continually growing. Um, the next uh, idea we had is, well, let's have a blog where we provide tips and tricks um, driven by the community. And we get the idea that by somewhere, some kind of point midway through this year, we would aim at having one article per day but we've already had, we've been doing one article per day for about four or five months already. Um, so every day you'll see an article here. Some of it is republished from, from existing blogs. Others are completely new materials um, written by these people and um, posted by these people. So if you have a blog and you want to get that content out to a broader audience, Fuji is the place to do that. So it's a way to not only promote Java Almanac and JVM command line argument type content, but also your own blog content. If you want to get it out to a broader audience, um, Fuji is um, fortunately and unfortunately uh, a WordPress site. So it has the advantage of basically doing what it needs to do. It's, it's WordPress, but of course it's not ideal. And over time we, we want it to be something different, but um, if, a nice thing about WordPress is everyone basically knows how it works. So you would get a user and a password. You would queue up your content. You would just put it into, into the WordPress, uh, future WordPress. And then every Monday on the Slack channel. So we have a Slack channel where, um, for Fuji, which you can join. You're very welcome to, to join it. And we discuss um, every Monday um, what will be published um, that week. So we currently doing basically one article a day, um, um, five days a week. And then um, you know, Helen Scott from JetBrain says, well, we have an article coming up. And then Jaden Ortlep from Payara says, oh, we have something as well. And you know, uh, Ruslan from, from J Elastic just joined. So there's, there's all kinds of different organizations involved. So that brings us to the point of who is behind this. Um, so Azul has taken this initiative. Uh, I work at Azul and I've I joined Azul specifically to work on this project. It didn't exist um, this time last year. It's um, literally started April last year, and we're pretty much getting close to the first uh, birth date of the project. And these are the organizations involved. So these are pretty well-known Java technology organizations. Um, you know, Stephen Chin from uh, from JFrog has nice things to say here. So this point of the Java community is greater than any single company is very much uh, behind this uh, this thinking, and um, also um, Simon Maple here from Sneak. It's incredibly important for every ecosystem to have a core location for information to help grow the Java community and be an educational resource. And Java has lacked this core space for many years. So, so this is what Fuji is trying to be, and you're welcome to join in in many different ways, either by reposting your content or posting new content. If you don't have your own blog, even better, you can blog all your content fresh from uh, Fuji. There's, of course, a Twitter um, handle as well. And um, you're warmly welcome to simply follow Fuji on Twitter. So that's Fuji.io. Since uh, a week, there are a 1,000 followers. And we've built up this following over the past half year or so um, that we've been really actively promoting uh, Fuji. And so what we're doing in this tour is really bringing the, bringing the word out there. Uh, we spent March going to about 10 different jugs, and now we're in April. And this is a stop um, on that tour um, to get the word out. So please uh, follow Fuji on Twitter and also contribute in other ways like um, 
on the in the blog or giving ideas. There might be other reference materials. If you're going to different places to find information about Java, ask yourself whether it wouldn't be um, handier to have all that information gathered together in one place. And that's really what you want to achieve with FUJ. Now, what does FUJ itself stand for as a final point? Um, so FUJ is a place for friends of OpenJDK. It does not, and this is a very important point, replace um, openjdk.java.net. Um, so this is this is a, a openjdk at java.net is a place for people who are contributing to openjdk. You are providing code to the openjdk repository. Instead, what FUJ is, is a place for people who are using the openjdk. So it's for technology usage like Payara, like Sneak, um, like all the different um, distributions, people who are using these uh, technologies. So the F here is for friends, and the first O is from of, and the second is from open, and then you have the J from JDK, and you would then have Fuj, which is not how you, you would want you to pronounce it. And so we've added the A and the Y to make it simple to pronounce. And that gives us a J, um, which gives us a nice logo, a bird, and also Fu, um, as we know in the Java uh, world, is often a placeholder, Fu and Bar in, uh, in demo code, and you should see FuJ as a placeholder for your own content, whether it is opinion polls, we have the event calendar, um, there are tweets here, um, there's terminology, I mean, does anyone know what the TCK actually is? So uh, FuJ tells you what it is. So there's a Fujipedia. Now, ultimately, what this is going to go to is the more content we have, the more sense it makes to do a search. So if I'm interested in JFAR, the Java flight recorder, nowhere else online will you find this um, functionality that you will now, um, when you search, get all the fixes chronologically sorted in the OpenJDK for JFAR, as well as blog posts that relate to that, including blog posts um, by Marcus Hurt, um, the developer, of course, behind uh, JFAR. And if you search for JavaFX, you will see as well all the fixes, as well as blog posts and articles on that topic. So this is what we want to do, really to provide a Wikipedia um, for Java developers. And so for that reason, it's very important that there's a lot of content um, to search um, on. Um, and so you can contribute. And we hope that this will really become a a central and useful resource uh, for the whole Java ecosystem to use, vendor neutral, anyone can participate, everyone is equal, um, and it's for the community and by the community. That's Fuji. With that, we should switch over to Simon to introduce um, modern Java development and his insights in that area. Okay, all right. So let me just put my slides in one before we start. Okay, so hopefully you can see my slides. Yes. Excellent. And then let me put them there. Good. Right. Yes. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Simon Ritter. I'm the deputy CTO of Azul Systems. And the idea behind this presentation is to help you understand all the wonderful things that have happened to Java in the last few years. And what I've done is to basically take the starting point as everything after JDK 11. JDK 11, the current long-term support release, JDK 17, which we'll get in September, is the next long-term support release. So I've kind of filled in the gaps between that. So you can understand all the things that you're going to be able to use when you want to deploy on JDK 17. There will be probably a few more things as well, but um, this is what we're dealing with at the moment. So the reality is that Java has changed. In fact, it's changed a lot. And not just from a technical point of view, but if you go back to JDK 9, what Oracle announced was that they were going to switch from being two, three, even four years between major releases of Java to suddenly we're going to have two releases every year. We're going to have one in March, one in September. And that has worked very well. What we've seen is that since JDK 9, we've had seven releases, which just seems incredible to think that we've gone from JDK 9 to JDK 16 in the space of only three years. And what this has resulted in is more features being delivered more quickly than we've ever seen before in Java. That's great for us as developers because a lot of the things that we want from Java 
tend to be quite small changes. I mean, yes, there are some, some bigger things that we would like to see, but a lot of the things that really kind of keep the language fresh and keep people interested in using Java is about those sort of small incremental changes. Now, one of the big impacts of using a six month release cycle rather than multiple years is it allows the developers of OpenJDK to be a bit more experimental with what they include. And this has resulted in two distinct sort of things. The first of these is incubator modules. Now, incubator modules defined by JEP 11, JEP is a JDK enhancement proposal. What this is about are APIs and tools, but including them into the JDK in a non-final state. But non-final doesn't mean beta. So it's not like they've kind of come up with an idea for an API, so they're going to roll it out in a beta form and then gradually develop it as people use it. These are very much full-featured, completed in terms of the development cycle. But what they want to do is have people actually use them in the real world, provide feedback, and then if any changes are needed to address what developers really want, then they've still got time to do that before it gets fixed in the standard. So this is, this is a good way of doing things. And because we only have six months between releases, it's actually easy to do this. First of these was actually introduced way back in JDK 9. That was the HTTP2 support, and that became final in, eight, in JDK 11. The other thing relates to the language. And so this is what we call preview features. Preview features, again, defined through JEP 12 in this case, are about how we can add new features to the language itself, the JVM, or anything which is considered part of Java SE. So it's, it's um, related to the specification of Java, which is a subset of OpenJDK. OpenJDK has got more bits in it. Java SE is the core functionality. Once again, it's about not having beta features. It's not developing things. It's fully formed, fully developed, but just with the idea that feedback might make some small changes in terms of what developers are going to do in real world use. One thing that they have said about this is that potentially if people really don't like a feature, they could pull the whole thing out. But I've not seen that happen and I don't think it's likely to happen. Most of these things are well thought out and it's just about kind of fine tuning them as we'll see as we go through. Now with preview features specifically, you have to enable them. Um, because they're not part of the standard. So in terms of write once run anywhere, you can't use them by default. So when you're compiling your code, you must use the enable preview flag and you must specify the release that you're interested in. So 14 or 15 or 16. And when you run your code, you must also tell the JVM that you want to enable those preview features because they have been compiled into the code. You don't need to specify the release version that's already encoded. You just need to say that I want to turn on those preview features. And there's one little special kind of corner case with, with preview features, which is that some uh, library changes might also be included under a preview feature rather than an incubator module. And that's specifically where you have things that relate to the Java SE specification. Anything that's in the Java or the Java X namespace comes under a preview feature rather than an incubator module. Right, let's start with JDK 12 then. What did we get there? Well, First of those was a nice preview feature. And this was the idea of switch expressions. If you look at Java as a language, we've had switch statements right from the very beginning. The idea that it's a sort of like a multi if statement, but in a kind of simpler form. This was a statement which meant that you couldn't take a value from that and assign it to a variable. It's just something that you execute and it does something, but you don't generate a result from it. The problem with the switch statement is that the syntax is a little bit clunky. It was taken directly from C, which is you know fine. People knew how to use it. But it, in C, it was designed in terms of the programming language as a low level programming environment for things like systems programming, compilers, and operating systems, and so on. And there are a couple of things in the way that the switch statement works, which can catch people out. And I'm sure that you know I've been caught out by this. I'm sure many people have as well. The fact that you have to remember to put a break statement in every case block. Now, sure, with IDEs nowadays, that's that's a much less risky kind of thing. But I know when I was writing code using VI, the editor, um, then 
So I would sometimes forget to put a break statement in and that would lead to the code falling through to the next switch block and you'd end up with a very difficult to find pug, bug in your uh, code. The other thing was that the scope of variables is not always intuitive. So there are a number of places where using switch statements can result in slightly less reliable code than you would get um, otherwise. Now, if we look at a, a, an example of the switch statement in use, this is a very common idiom in terms of using this. We have one variable called day, and we want to assign a value to another variable, number of letters. And so we do that by saying, okay, switch on day, case Monday, Friday, Sunday, set the number of letters to be six, and so on. That's all good. But again, it's, it's somewhat error prone. Not only do we have the issue of the break, having to remember to put that in every case block, but we also have the issue of remembering that for every set of case statements, we also need to assign a value to number of letters. Otherwise we could get indeterminate information. So that's the old code. And if you look at that, there's lots of lines of code and it's all quite verbose. With the switch expression introduced in JDK 12, it becomes a lot simpler. So we look at this now, it's an expression, which means we can take a result from it and we can assign it once. So number of letters is assigned the value of whatever is returned by that switch expression. And that's really good because now by doing it once, we don't have to worry about remembering to do it in each case block. The second thing that we can see here is that the developers of this particular feature have looked around and they have found this incredibly powerful feature that nobody had known about before called a comma separated list. So rather than having to have case Monday, case Friday, case Sunday, we have case Monday, comma, Friday, comma, Sunday. Who would have thought it'd take 25 years to realize that you could do that? But now we do. Excellent. That's one of the best things about this. Having done that, what we need to do is then assign a value that we're going to return from the expression. And we do that by stealing some of the syntax out of the Lambda expression. So we use the arrow operator. The right-hand side of the arrow operator is what's going to be returned by the expression. So six or seven or eight. And if need be, we can throw an exception because we've got a situation that we don't need to be able to deal with. So we, we throw an illegal state exception if we need to. So as you can see, we've reduced a large number of lines of code into a small number of lines of code. We've eliminated the problems of the break. We've eliminated the problems of the assignment. Much more reliable, much easier to, to actually see what's going on. One of the things they did was they also said, well, actually, you can combine the old style syntax with the new style syntax. You can debate about whether that's a good idea or not, but this is the way it works. So you still assign the result of the switch statement to number of letters, but now you've still got case Monday, case Friday, case Sunday. And this time, rather than using the arrow operator, they say break and then use the number that's going to be returned from the expression. Now, this will work because you can break from within a switch, switch statement and break to a label that's elsewhere in your code. It's very rare that you do that, but it is possible. Thing is that in terms of the label, you can't start a label with a number. So the fact that you can do break six is distinct from break my label, for example. So that will all work. It's probably not the, the best way of doing things, but if you're doing a sort of gradual migration, maybe that's what you want to do. In terms of APIs, there's one kind of interesting one in JDK 12 that I picked out, which is that there's a new collector in the streams API, and that's called the T collector. What that does is take three arguments. First is a collector, the second is a collector, and the third is a by function. And if you look at the diagram here, this kind of shows what's actually happening. The stream that you have that you're passing to this collector is duplicated and each of those individual streams is passed through the two collectors that you specified as argument to the teeing parameter to the teeing method. Those two results are then taken and passed as input to the by function, and then the result is what you get at the end. So if we look at that in terms of some sample code, we can see how that actually works. Now, an example here is I've got a stream of numbers, 145217. I pass them into collect. And I use my new T in collector. I've done the static import that you can't see on my slide. And we'll say the first collector we're going to use is summing double. So that will take the values on the input stream and it will add them all up and give us a total. The second stream, which is identical, will pass through the counting collector 
and that will tell us how many elements we've got on the input string. We take the total, we take the number of elements, we pass those into our by function, which simply divides one by the other, and that gives us the average value of the numbers that we passed in. Now, I know that you could do this with a single method call, but the idea here is just to demonstrate what the code can do and how you can actually use teeing as a collector. So it's quite a nice little addition to the, the toolbox of streams and being able to do more sort of flexible things with what we're, we're working on. Moving on to JDK 13. Now JDK 13, I would say, was one of the sort of more minor releases, not so much stuff in there. What we got was text blocks. And in this case, another preview feature. What happens here is that in Java, we've always had strings and we can define string literals, that's no problem. But from a multi-line point of view, that's always been quite complicated. And we've had the issue of if we want to put new lines in our strings, we have to do weird things with um, new line characters or we have to concatenate strings and do all sorts of things like that. Text blocks makes that a whole lot easier. They've kind of borrowed some of the syntax from other languages. So in this case, it's, well, you could say Python because Python does it this way. You can have rather than one double quote to indicate the start and the end of a string, we use three double quotes. And when we use three double quotes, everything after that will be treated as the string, even the new lines, any special characters, up until the next three double quotes. If you were to require three double quotes inside your string, then what you would have to do is escape at least the first one of those. So you put a backslash in front of at least the first one. You can do the first one, the second one, and the third one if you want to, but you only need to do the first one. The couple of important things about this, first is that you have to have the three double quotes, the opening one, on a separate line. So you couldn't start your HTML tags after, directly after the three double quotes, you have to start it on the next line. The next thing that's important about this is how we've laid this out. Now, if we run that code and see what the output is, we see that in terms of our HTML tags, they're aligned with the left-hand margin in a way that we would expect them to be. But if we look at the code above, clearly there's indentation which is useful for looking at the layout of the code. The way that works is that text blocks deal with what's called incidental white space. An incidental white space is all the white space to the left of the first character in terms of our text block. What will happen is the compiler, when it generates the string literal for this, will remove all the incidental white space. And that way we can left justify the HTML tags that we've got, which is what we want, but still have them nicely laid out so that they don't have to be left justified in terms of the layout of our code. So that's always a good idea. So it makes the code look nicer and easier to read. Now, what we can do is we can reduce the amount of incidental white space if we want to. So we could move the three double quotes over to the left. And what that will do is introduce some intentional white space, intentional indentation. So we may have the fact that we want four characters as indentation. That will be the int intentional white space. Then we've got our incidental white space, which is on the left-hand side. And if we print that out, what we'll see is that our HTML tags are now moved over to the right by the four spaces that we wanted. And just one little thing to point out about that is you do get an additional blank line. That's just one little tiny kind of thing that mm, not totally sure about that, but anyway. Switch expression, hang on. I've already talked about the switch expression. Why am I talking about it again? Well, remember, switch expression was a preview feature and there was some feedback from developers and they said, well, yes, you can do it this way, but we think it'd be better if you did it that way. And specifically this idea of combining the old style syntax with new style syntax and using break to indicate the value that was going to be returned by the expression. People said, Yes, you can get away with it because a label can't start with a number, but it's a bit confusing and we would rather not do that. So the developers said, okay, we will listen to feedback and we will change break to yield. So now you do yield six or yield seven, and that's the value that's returned. Small change, but I think it's, it's good. It certainly shows that preview features work and that changes can be made before it becomes part of the standard. JDK 14. Now, JDK 14 was a, an interesting release that had several new things in it. So rather than JDK 13, that was a slightly sort of small release, JDK 14, a bit of a bigger release. And again, this shows how the six months release cadence works very nicely, because even though there are only six months between each release, 
features can be added as and when they're ready. So some will have more than others. Let's look at a simple data class in Java, how we would do something like a point. Well, what we can do is we can create our class. So we create a class called point. Then we need two instance variables, a double X and a double Y. We'll make those final. We need a constructor, which takes two arguments, X and Y. All that does is assign the values of X and Y to the instance variables, X and Y. And then we need two accessor methods that we can retrieve the values of X and Y. This is essentially a tuple. Why we don't have a tuple in Java is, is a big discussion, but you know it's one of those things that we've never had a tuple in Java. Actually, that's not strictly speaking true. There is a tuple class buried somewhere in the API, but it's not a sort of obvious java.util.tuple. Um, so this is the kind of thing that we end up creating a lot, is just a simple data class which has two instance variables associated with it. You look at that, and there's 14 lines of code. So it's not really very kind of handy in terms of boilerplate. Records is a new preview feature again in JDK 14. So we're seeing lots of preview features coming in. And what that does is say, let's define our point as a record, essentially a data class. And let's avoid having to do all of the boilerplate code that's required for that. Now we end up with a single line. We define record point, and then we specify that it's going to have a double X and a double Y as instance variables, parameters of the constructor, and so on. And we have an empty set of braces to indicate there's no code that we need to define within that. Now, a record is just a special form of a class in the same way that enumeration is a special form of a class. So you can treat it in the same way as a class from the point of view of instantiating it. You can do all the sorts of things that you would do with a class um, with a record. One of the other things that they did was to include the ability to have a compact constructor there are situations where rather than in the example above where you don't want anything special you just want to assign the values of x and y to the instance variables what you might want is a little bit more logic in terms of the constructor range is a good example of that so we have a low and a high value that we want to store in our record but this time when we call the constructor we want to test whether low is greater than high and if it is we want to reject that so we'll throw an illegal argument exception we can do that using the compact constructor we can include the logic for the test and the throwing an exception and if you see there we don't need in terms of the constructor to specify the parameters they're already there on the line above where we define the record it's just redundant having to say range int low int high again so that's nice compact constructor allows us to do that kind of thing there are a number of additional details you need to be aware of with records and how to use them effectively so the first is that compact constructor that we just saw, that can only throw unchecked exceptions. There's no syntax in the compact constructor to allow you to specify a throws clause with a checked exception. So illegal argument exception, null pointer exception, they're all good. But if you've got your own exception you want to throw from there, nope, can't do it. So it is a limitation. Um, you know, there was some discussion about this, but it is a limitation on what you can do there. Because a record is a class, obviously it inherits ultimately from object. And the way that the syntax of records work is that you can override the equals hash code or two string methods of object. If you want to provide your own definition of how to represent a record as a string, you can do that. Or if you want a hash code or an equals, you can do that. Other methods with an object, you can't override. So it's just those three that you can specify within the structure of your record. Records are a special form of class, and to that end, they all inherit directly from java.lang.record. And this is an interesting thing because this is one of those places where they had to add java.lang.record to the Java SE specification, if you like, but not make it part of that specification directly. So it's um, part of the preview feature and not included directly in the spec. What this means is that records, even though they're classes, cannot subclass another class. So that's a limitation, but that's that's fine, same as enumerations. But because we have multiple inheritance of types in Java, you can implement as many interfaces as you want in a record. Records don't follow the Java bean pattern. Another big discussion that was had about whether you should use X or get X for the accessor methods, and similarly get Y or Y. Um, the way that they went with that 
is they decided to use X and Y, just the name of the, the variable itself, rather than the bean, get X, get Y. My personal opinion, I like get X, get Y, but lots of people like just having X or Y. You know, you ask 50 developers whether they prefer tabs over spaces, you're gonna get, you know, 25 going each way. Same thing with X versus get X. The instance fields that you have in a record have to be defined by the structure of the record itself. So in the brackets that you've got, you must define all of the instance fields that are going to be in that record. You can't have extra ones in the body unless they're static. So you can put static fields in there, but obviously they're shared amongst all instances of the record. Any instance variables have to be defined as part of the record. And the last thing is, again, because they're like classes, you can use generic type parameters and that will all work in exactly the same way that we're used to. Instance of, another language feature introduced in JDK 14 was not instance of, that's been there since the beginning. But if we look at how instance of works, we see this as pretty much the typical way that everybody uses it. We're past a reference of something that we don't know exactly what the type is. And we could say, well, okay, it's an object, great. But we don't know what specific type it is within our hierarchy. To determine that, we can use instance of as a test. And we can say, if obj instance of string, great. If it is a string in the body of our if statement, if we want to use that reference as a string, we can't directly use obj because it's not defined as a string wherever we've made it available. We have to then do an explicit cast. So we have to say string s equals, and then cast it to a string obj. Okay, it's not a huge amount of code, it's one extra line, but it's a bit fiddly and it's one of those kind of rough edges that would be better if we could remove it. So that's what they're doing. In JDK 14, we have what's called pattern matching instance of. Looking at the title of that, don't be confused. This is not like regular expression pattern matching. This is pattern matching of patterns in code. And the way that we use instance of is a very specific pattern. There are lots of other ideas for how to use pattern matching for code in future um, sort of features. So we'll, we'll be seeing some more of those in maybe JDK 17 around things like um, switch expressions and even how we work with records and so on. But in this case, what we're doing is we're recognizing that there is this pattern that we use very frequently with instance of. So how do we simplify it? Now what you can do is eliminate that explicit cast by saying if obj instance of string, and then specify the variable name of which we want to use in terms of the, the string itself. So within the true branch of that if statement, s is a string, so object, oh, sorry, object is a string, so therefore s is valid in terms of its scope. So we can print out s.length, we can call the length method on s, s is a string, it all works. In the false branch, because it isn't the string, the scope of S doesn't extend there. So we couldn't call S, we couldn't try and call methods on that because we don't have a string. We can be a little bit more clever with that. And so what we could say is if object instance of string S, and then we use the and operator and say S.length is greater than zero. This will work because in the case of an and operator, we always evaluate the left-hand side first. And only if that evaluates to true, do we attempt to evaluate the right-hand side. So as long as obj is a string, s has scope, and therefore we can call s.length and test it against greater than zero, and then print out the length. If we were to use an or statement, we would have to evaluate both sides, and we wouldn't be able to determine first if s was, sorry, if obj was in fact a string, and so potentially we'd be calling s.length, which on s that doesn't have scope, and so that won't work. And the compiler will find that for us, and it will say, sorry, no, that's not going to work because you don't know that s is going to be valid at that point. Um, yes, uh, the other thing that you need to be aware of in terms of the scoping, the scoping can sometimes be a little bit sort of uh, less than you know obvious, shall we say. So we could do something like this. We could say, if not o instance of string and s dot length greater than three, we return. After that, we know that obj, uh, sorry, o has to be a string. So s, the scope is going to be valid. So we could then still use s after that. So it doesn't have to be restricted to within the if um, branch of the state, but uh, if 
true branch of the statement, we can actually do it uh, elsewhere as well. So scoping is, is what's called flow scoping. Text blocks, again, preview feature. So people gave feedback, a couple of extra ideas to that. Second preview, they added two new escape sequences to that. Essentially, the first one is a backslash, which allows you to do a continuation of the line. Anybody who's done shell programming will be familiar with this or, or make files, then you understand about this. So essentially it's saying, okay, I've got a new line within the text in my source code, but I actually don't want a new line in the string literal that's being generated. So I can put a backslash after the not, that won't put a, back, uh, won't put a new line in, but there will be a new line after the middle one. And that also gets around the problem that we saw earlier where we have the new line at the end if we put in um, intentional white space. So we can get rid of that um, awkward new line. And then there's also a backslash S, which allows you to put space at the end of the string. So you can include um, intentional white space at the end as well. Helpful null pointer exception. This is probably my favorite feature from JDK 14 and probably from several releases as well. Anybody who's written any form of Java for you know more than like hello world type thing will have at some point got a null pointer exception. It just happens, doesn't it? The problem that we face is when we do something like this. So we've got a chain of calls, A calls B calls C calls I, and we try and assign 99 to it. Okay, that's all good. But what we might get is something like this. Okay, there's a null pointer exception. Hmm. Okay, we know it's on line five in our code. So we look at that and we go, right, is A null? So we can't call B. Is B null? So we can't call C. Is C null? So we can't call I. Hmm, don't know. So we either have to invoke our debugger and we have to try and figure it out, or we have to start splitting up the line, or we have to put print statements in. And it's like, oh, no, that's just, you know, takes time. So now, JDK 14, we get this. Exception thread main, null pointer exception, cannot read field C because A dot B is null. We straight away know that now A dot B is the problem. We can trace that back, figure out where did we not get B from and so on, and it all works. This is a brilliant feature. The only downside to this feature is the fact you actually have to enable it. Why? Why do you have to enable? This is, this is brilliant. Why do we have to enable it? But so apparently you do. So you have to use this really catchy, short, easy to remember, minus XX plus show code details in exception messages. They couldn't have made that any longer, could they? Anyway, moving on, JDK 15, another interesting release. Java is an object-oriented language, so we have inheritance in Java. We can have a class hierarchy. In this simple example here, we've got shape as our superclass, and then we've got three subclasses, triangle, square, and pentagon. This is all very good. The issue that we have is that we have no control really over who can inherit from a particular class. The only control we've got is to make it final and say nobody can inherit from that particular class. But if we want to have more fine grained control, there's no way of doing that. So essentially, once you've made shape available, anybody can look at that and go, oh, shape, that's kind of handy. I'm going to inherit from that. And off you go. In JDK 15, they've introduced the idea of sealed classes. And sealed class, another preview feature. What this allows you to do is to have control over who can inherit from your class. Effectively, you can think of final as being the ultimate sealed class. It's, it's completely sealed. But what we're going to be able to do is say, OK, anybody who wants to inherit from that must have their name listed in terms of the definition of our class. And one small detail here is, although it's called sealed classes, it also applies to interfaces. And when I first looked at this, I thought to myself, hmm, wouldn't sealed types have been a better name for this particular feature? And I, I did tweet about that. And Brian Gertz came back to me and he said, well, yes, we were originally going to call it sealed types. But then we decided that because interfaces are actually a, a form of class, that we call it sealed classes. So I learned something there. I learned that interfaces are, in fact, a type of class. Now, the way this works is they use contextual keywords. And this is a, a slightly new feature. It's actually from um, the, the change was made in JDK 16, but I'll talk about it in JDK 15 because it's easier to talk about it with sealed classes. Um, in Java, we have a number of reserved words that you can't use for variable names. And there are certain times when, for particular features, they need to add new reserved words. So this happened if you go all the way back to JDK 1.4, 
assertions were introduced and the assert became a reserved word. Same in JDK5, we got enumerations and enum became a reserved word. That had impact in terms of backwards compatibility because anybody who'd used enum as a variable name, their code wouldn't compile with JDK5. Of course, I thought to myself, nobody would use enum as a variable name. I tried compiling some of my code and discovered I had used enum as a variable name. What they've done to get around that is um, what they refer to as restricted identifiers and restricted keywords. Var is a good example of that because in JDK 10, we got the local variable type inference as a feature and that needed var as a special word. Rather than making var a reserved word, meaning that you couldn't use var as a variable name, which would have broken lots of code, they said, let's make it a reserved type. So in JDK 10, you couldn't create a class called var with a lowercase v, which you technically could have done, but would never would have done in JDK 9. So now they're using what are called contextual keywords. And that means that they only apply as keywords in certain places in terms of the syntax. And for sealed classes, there are three of these, sealed, permits, and a special one called non-sealed. And this is one that, again, has caused discussion because it has a hyphen in it. That's not a problem because um, no variable names can have a hyphen in them. That's not part of the um, Java syntax. But a lot of people are like, ooh, we're not sure about having hyphens in, in reserved words. But there you go. I think the idea is that it make, makes more reserved words available. Anyway. In terms of sealed classes, all the classes that are going to take part in this must be either in the same package or the same module. So it's, it's restricting the access there so people in other modules and packages can't make, take part in this. How this works is by adding some modifiers to the way that we define a class. So now what we say is public, sealed as a modifier, class shape, and then we add a permits clause to the definition of shape saying that triangle, square, and pentagon are the classes that are permitted to inherit from shape. That way our type hierarchy will work and all of the classes will compile. If someone comes along and says, oh, shape, that looks handy. I want to use that as a superclass to something I'm going to call circle. Because it's not listed in the permits clause, it won't compile and you get an error and you'll be able to see why you can't do that. A um, couple of other things about sealed classes. All the subclasses have to have their inheritance capabilities explicitly specified. So you can't have a class which then just goes, okay, it's triangle, off you go. So there are three possible things that you can do in terms of specifying the inheritance capabilities. First is that you can continue having further sealed classes inheriting from that. So you again say public sealed class triangle and you specify another permits clause, equilateral, isosceles and so on. And that extends shape. Second thing you could do is turn off all further subclassing. So you just make it final, the existing modifier that we have. And the third one which uses this uh, hyphenated keyword is to essentially say we're turning off sealing of this particular class so anybody can now inherit from that. So you say public non-sealed class pentagon extends shape. Those are the three things you can, you can do. You must do one of those for any class which is part of a sealed class hierarchy. Contextual keyword humor. Yes, so when I did this um, the presentation a while back, somebody pointed this out as quite an interesting idea. So you can define two ints, one called non and one called sealed. And then you could do something like this in its valid code. You can go var var equals non hyphen sealed. Now, because non sealed is a, a contextual keyword, it only applies when you're defining a class. So in this case, what we're actually doing is non minus sealed. But I wouldn't recommend writing code like this. It looks confusing. So at least put a space between the non and the minus and the minus and the sealed. But I thought that was kind of entertaining. Hidden classes. Um, There's another thing in JDK 14, I'm oh, sorry, 15, got to get them right, which one version we're using. Um, this is not like sealed classes. This is actually in the JVM level. So there are situations where it would be useful to have classes that are hidden from the runtime system in terms of uh, accessibility through reflection and so on. Um, so the way this works is that if you're using situations where you've got invoke dynamic being involved, so like Lambda expressions, for example, then to avoid people being able to use them um, where they, they might not necessarily be um, the best user resources, then 
they make them hidden classes. And that way you can restrict where they're, they're accessible within the code. And that way you can make more effective use of the resources. So Lambda expression is a good example of this. What am I trying to say? Um, you use a Lambda expression within a stream. So rather than defining that Lambda expression and having it available in the whole of that, that method, maybe that's like lots and lots of code, what you do is you make it a hidden class within just the scope of that stream. And then you eff effectively can garbage collect or reclaim the resources from that Lambda expression once you're outside of the stream. So it, it's sort of scoping that class within that area to make better use of resources. Records um, as a second preview in JDK 15. Again, a couple of changes being made, people providing feedback. First is that they decided that in terms of records, the fields should be truly final. Now, you might think that when you set an instance variable, you say it's final, that you can set the value once and then you can't change it. Well, you can't change it in terms of assigning a value to it by equals, but if you use reflection, then you can change it. And in records, now you can't do that. It'll throw in the legal access exception. It won't let you change it. So they're truly final. They also prohibited uh, native methods from records. They just decided that that was something that could uh, introduce behavior that was dependent on external state. So they removed that from the specification. And they also introduced the idea of local records so that you can use a, a record within a method and have it scoped within that so that it improves, again, the sort of efficiency of how you use these things. This is really nice. This is one of my favorite features in, in terms of records. So we can see here we've got a, a method that we've got find top sellers. It's going to take a list of people who are selling stuff for us. And we want to determine the order of who sold the most in a particular month. To do that, we can use obviously streams to do it. But now we can use a local record to simplify that code. Our local record is going to be called sales. That has a seller and a value for the number of sales they made in a particular time. When we use our stream code, what we do is we take our stream of sellers we map that into a stream of sales records, local records, which have the seller in it and the amount that they sold in the given month that we're testing against. We then pass that list or that stream into sorted and we sort them by the value of how much they sold. That gives us all the, re the local records in order of, of sales. Then we map them back from the sales local record into the vendors, sorry, the sellers, and then we collect that into a list. So we end up with a, a list of the, the sellers based on how much they've actually sold in a given month. By using a local record, simplifies the code, makes it a whole lot easier for us. So this is really good use of, of that kind of um, feature. Also, they made records work with sealed classes because sealed classes, you can work with interfaces as well. So you can have a sealed interface called car, permits red car, and blue car. And then a record, even though you can't inherit from another class, you can implement an interface. So red car can implement car, blue car can implement car, and it all works. JDK 16, bringing us right up to date. So pattern matching in the instance of, uh, this was included as a final feature now. So they, they went through um, and said, okay, we've gone through a couple of iterations. Now we'll make it part of the specification. And two changes they made there. First was that the pattern variables are no longer implicitly final. I think that's a good idea because um, if you make them implicitly final, you can't change them. Um, even though you've uh, you know, identified something as a string, you want to change its value, why shouldn't you be able to change it? And then the other change they made was um, to introduce the fact that it was a compile time error to compare an expression of type S against the pattern of type T where S is a subtype of T. And you have to read that a couple of times to figure out what that actually means. So if we use an example, this is the kind of thing that won't work. If you've got a, a method, print up a left colored point and you pass in a rectangle to that, and then you do if r instance of rectangle, well, obviously it's an instance of rectangle because you passed a rectangle there. So it's, it's a redundant if statement, it will always evaluate to true. So that if you try and run it with J shell, you'll see this and it's a uh, type rectangle is a subtype of expression type rectangle and it won't compile. APIs, um, Unix domain sockets, this is just a way of doing inter-process communication, which is typically used on, well, Unix machines and also on Macs because they're based on Unix machines, Linux, obviously. This wasn't part of the API spec in the past. 
reason for that was that Windows didn't support Unix domain sockets until I think Windows 10. So now that they do, we can do cross-platform, write once, run anywhere, and it will work in the same way. The way that people used to do this uh, without having access to uh, Unix style sockets was to use a TCP IP loopback. This is identical in terms of the way that you use it. It's just that it's better in terms of security, better in terms of performance. So now you can create a Unix domain socket using the of method as a factory method rather than a constructor. Streams map multi, this is very similar to flat map. When you read the description, you think to yourself, this is flat map. So each element on the input stream is mapped to zero or more elements on the output stream. Difference is that you can apply mapping at the same time. So example here, I've got a stream of words, programming languages, pass it into map multi, that uses a by consumer, so two inputs to consume. And what we'll do is we'll say strut is the first parameter. That's the stream strings that we're getting from our list. Then consumer is the thing that we're going to pass the results to. And we can see here what we're doing is we're actually taking the number of letters in each of those words and printing that number that number of times. The important thing to get here is that when you call the accept method on the consumer, you can do that as many times as you like. So you can generate multiple elements on the output stream using that mapping. So it's, it's again, a nice sort of addition to the stream toolbox. Vector API, uh, not to be confused with the vector class, which is the old style way of doing you know, collections and things like that. This is an incubator module. So again, not part of the SE specification. And what it does is allow you to specify how to um, use vector operations at the processor level. The reason this is necessary is that, that um, vector operations are very wide registers, single instruction, multiple data. And compilers struggle a lot to figure out where you can actually use vector operations. If it's a simple thing, they can do it. But anything that gets more complicated, any kind of conditional operations um, really stumps most modern compilers. So what you really want is the ability to have the compiler do this rather than specify it manually. The way this works is if we look at a simple example, which I would expect most compilers to be able to catch anyway, what we're doing here is we've got two arrays of floats and we want to generate a result in a third array of floats, which is the result of a squared plus b squared times minus one. Now we can do that with the simple code we've got here, but it may be the compiler doesn't use a vector operation for that. Using a bit more complicated code, we can do that. So the first thing we need to do is identify a species for what we're going to do in terms of our float vector. And that essentially means we need to know what the processor capabilities are in terms of how wide the registers are. In this case, we're going to use a 256-bit wide register. Our method then gets changed. So the first thing we need to do is to figure out how to index into the vector that we're going to use. So how to jump to the next place where to ins insert the value that we want to process. Then we need to create a float vector from the arrays. So we take our array A and we iterate across that, filling in the vector. Do the same with B. And then we call the operation that we want. So we say VC, the, the um, thing that we're going to generate, is VA times VA. So A squared, add VB multiplied by VB, so B, B squared, and then negate it. Now, one of the things I, I don't actually like about this API, and I did write this in my blog post and, and I, got, I got flack from Brian Gertz on this, was the fact that we use three letter abbreviations, mol and neg. Why don't we just use multiply and negate? I know it's a little bit more typing, but it's easier to read. But anyway, and then we just take the results and we extract them out into the array that we want for the results. For a memory access API, this is part of um, Project Panama interaction with native code, making it more easily. This is also part of a replacement for the Sun Misc Unsafe uh, undocumented internal API so that we do have a public way of accessing memory. This has really kind of three main parts to it. There's a memory segment, which is in, in essence a pointer to an area of memory that you want to be able to use. You've got a memory address, which is a pointer to a specific address in memory. And then you've got a memory layout, which allows you to define what your area of memory is going to hold so that you can make it easier to interact with that. If you want to use a simple example, you can create uh, an area of memory, a bit like doing malloc in C and 100 bytes 
that gives you a, a, a memory segment, which is the pointer to where that area of memory starts. Then you can use memory access to get through to that. You can actually set the integers by calculating the offset based on its four bytes long and then storing the values that you've got there. You can also use memory layout. Um, as I said, you can specify the, the layout of the area of memory that you want to use. And then you can use a var handle to, to make life easier for yourself. In this case, what we're doing is we're saying, OK, let's create that area of memory that we want, 100 bytes long. But in this case, what it's actually going to do is create 100 bytes representing 25 integers, which are four bytes in width. And so 32 bits in width, and we can specify that the order we want is the native order used by the machine we're running on. We don't care whether it's least significant byte or most significant byte. Then we get a var handle so that we can access that area of memory using that information. And then what we can do is do the same thing, but now we don't have to calculate the offset directly by remembering it's four times the number of bytes. We can just use the, uh, the var handle and then index through that. Since I'm running out of time, I'm going to kind of move on from this a little bit more quickly. Foreign Linker API. Um, this is also related to Project Panama. And again, it's an incubator module. And what we can see here is a way of accessing things like library functions outside of Java in a, a simpler way than we do with JNI. Now, I say simpler. This looks quite complicated. It is a little bit uh, heavy in terms of the code. But once we get the J extract command from Pan Project Panama, this becomes so simple because essentially what you end up with is static import. And then you can just call a method which directs through into the native library and it works really, really nicely. So I, I like Project Panama. What you have to do at the moment is first get a reference to the C linker so that you can reference external um, functions. Then you have to look up the function that you want. In this case, we're using the default library, which means we're using whatever the JVM has access to. Since we're running on top of a machine that has get PID, we can do that. And then we need a, a method handle to be able to call that method or that function. And the way that works is using a down call handle. Down call because we're calling down to the method rather than up call, which is what you would use on a, a callback from a native method, sorry, native function into a Java method. So we create a down call handle. To get PID, we say that this is going to return an int. And so we've got the mapping between the uh, int on the C platform or the, the underlying platform and the int that we have in Java. Then we just call get PID invoke exact, and that will return us the PID of the uh, process that we're running on. Warnings for value based classes um, related to Project Valhalla, which is something, a bigger project in terms of adding value types to Java. And a lot of this is to do with how we deal with primitive types. So now one of the things they want to do is to um, do away with the constructors on the wrapper classes, integer, float, and so on. They were deprecated in JDK 9. Now they've been marked for removal. So expect in JDK 17 that they go away completely. Most people you know, don't use that. They use um, uh, was it auto boxing and unboxing and things like that. So it's, it shouldn't be a big issue. The other thing is you'll get a warning if you attempt to synchronize on an instance of a value based class like an integer or a float. Last thing, uh, strongly encapsulate JDK internals by default. Um, this was something that was introduced in JDK 9, or at least they attempted to introduce this, to do away with access to all the internal APIs in the JDK. But because things like Spring were using things like Sun, Misc, Unsafe, they couldn't do that straight away. They introduced this wonderfully named big kill switch or the illegal access command line flag. That has four different values, permit, warn, debug, or deny. At the moment, up until JDK 16, that was set to permit, meaning that you had access to the internal APIs. Now it's been set by default to deny. You can still override it. Um, but that still means you do have access to the critical internal APIs, which includes Sun, Misc, Unsafe. So it's not, we're not quite there yet at all of the internal APIs being encapsulated, but we're getting pretty close. Just summarize then, um, I will just briefly mention Zulu Enterprise because that's our build of OpenJDK. It is fully TCK tested. We go all the way back to JDK 6 for extended support, 7, 8, 11, 13. I should also add 15 because that's uh, one of our what we call medium term support releases. 
we have backported a couple of features to JDK 8 specifically, things like TLS 1.3 for better security and flight recorder. So you can uh, monitor a JDK 8 machine with mission control. Wide platform support, Intel 64-bit versions for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Also older versions, 32-bit for Windows and Linux, and very much just a drop-in replacement for other JDKs. It's you know TCK tested, so you can just use it the same way as other ones. To conclude, six months release cycle working very well. I really think that we're seeing lots of new features coming through. This is all really good. JDK 12, 16, lots of new features that we've gone through. And what I would recommend is start preparing for JDK 17. So start doing testing with JDK 16, make sure your application code works. Somebody was talking about Lombok this morning when I did a, a presentation earlier on, and they were saying that I had some issues with JDK 16 because they were referencing some internal um, resource bundles, I think it was, and that had caused them some problems. But testing with JDK 16 is a very good idea if you want to move JDK 17 as a long-term support release. And if you want to deploy into production, use Zulu. So that's it. Um, I shall stop sharing my screen and then we can see if we've got questions. And I went a little bit over time there, I'm afraid. That's fine. Thanks, Simon. Um, there aren't any questions in the chat at the moment. Um, I have a little, well, a couple of little questions, I suppose, that kind of maybe break the ice a little. So you mentioned hidden classes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I immediately I was thinking of anonymous classes and wondering what the difference was. Yeah, it's, so anonymous classes are ones that are generated by the compiler. Um, right. Hidden classes is more to do with the JVM at runtime. And as I say, th what they wanted to be able to do, th there are certain situations where different um, uses of, of the JVM will generate classes um, at runtime. Um, anything that's using invoke dynamic, so that the Lambda expression is, is the good example of that. But there are other frameworks that do a similar thing. And the idea is that if you can make that hidden so that people can't see it from general code, then you can restrict its use. And that way you can minimize the use of resources. So it's, it's the, the, the classic example is if you've got a really big method and then within that method, you've got a, a, a stream operation. The stream operation uses a, a Lambda expression and that Lambda expression results in a functional interface instance being generated, so it's a class, and you use that only for the, the time when you're doing that stream operation. Now, rather than having that, that class around for the whole time that method's running, which could be a long time, and that could be a, a complicated thing that involves a lot of resources, by making it hidden, you can say, okay, we'll, we'll create it when we need to build the stream. Once we finish the stream, because nobody else can see it, we can garbage collect it, we can reclaim all the resources and then carry on with the code. So it's it's more effective use of the resources in the JVM. Right. Yeah. It is a bit complicated, I, I will admit. I, I probably didn't describe that too well. No, no, I think it makes sense. It feels like uh, an optimization then essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's fine. Um, if anyone has got any questions, I'm, if you'd like to just ask them in the chat, that would be that'd be good. Um, I do have one other kind of thing that we'll, we'll see if anybody else has a question. I don't want to dominate, but I'll ask it anyway while we wait. Um, so I'm interested around, obviously, we're hitting Java 16 now. As you mentioned there, Java 17 is the next long term support. Um, how have you seen adoption up to 16 so far? Yeah, um, not many people that I'm talking to are following the six month release cycle. There's, there's, there's a few, you know, who are sort of um, trying to trying to lead the way if you like especially if, you, if you're more of a kind of startup then you can probably adopt the the new release cycle more easily and you know if you're doing continuous integration continuous deployment that makes life a little bit easier but most people are focusing on the long-term support versions and we, we still see a lot of people using eight people are gradually making the the switch to 11 because that is a long-term support release. And then we'll see people starting to move to 17 when that comes out. But again, that's going to be slower because it, people need to go through all the testing phases and so on. Um, I think the switch from eight to 11 because of modularity and because of some of the issues of that has, has taken longer. But I think the switch from 11 to 17 will be easier. 
hopefully because people have had a chance to test a lot of the functionality as we've gone through that development and then when we get 17 it's not a big surprise as we've got three whole years worth of stuff suddenly dropped on people they've had a chance to go through and do testing yeah i, sp I suppose like thinking about breaking changes from 11 to 17 the illegal access sounds like that default mode of deny is potentially something that if you're using frameworks, I suppose that like, it is potentially moved on. They evolved to, to kind of solve these problems in their code bases now. Yeah, it is potentially, but I think from what I've read that there's not too many things that are going to be affected by that because Sun Misc Unsafe is still available. So the, the critical internal APIs are still there. There's six of those. Um, they're not affected by this. So anyone who's using Sun Misc Unsafe still can continue doing that and it's not going to change that but um that's probably one that will have a, a, a some impact but other than that breaking changes between 11 and, and 17 there's not really many at the sort of um the specified level like i say lombok run into a problem because that they were using undocumented features but at a specified level there's a few kind of obscure apis that have been removed but they've been deprecated for ages and they're ones that very few very few people would have been using anyway so i don't really see a lot of breaking changes between 11 and 17. cool yeah looking forward to i think at my organization we're in that position where we're on 11. Mm -hmm. it's it's the rate of change like the you know, i'm just trying to keep up is it's like it's one of those things you have to balance isn't it but i think we're we'll yeah. definitely looking at getting to 17 as soon as that's available and getting the benefit of all these optimizations and new features which sound really good Excellent. So, yeah, I think that kind of um, wraps us up. So thank you very much, Simon, for joining. And yeah, real you. pleasure. Sounds about Fuji. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah, I think um, I've, I've used it a bit since I kind of noticed it, and, and it's definitely a very useful resource, um, which is like that, like you say, that nice kind of place where you can go lots of rich information and direction. Yeah. Yeah. And if there's anything, any other reference material or content we could put there, I mean, another something that we were thinking of is an education um, sub section. So right. maybe students at universities uh, could um, get their teeth, uh, get their feet wet, teeth wet, not the teeth wet, their feet wet. <laughs> <laughs> cut their teeth, <laughs> cut their feet, right? <laughs> on, yeah. the, on, on the doing some Java technical uh, blogging on, the, on Fuji, right. um, you know, a safe place where they can share their uh, insights and information. Yeah, that sounds sounds good. Yeah, so this event's been recorded. We'll um, we'll put this up on YouTube shortly, and yeah, we'll watch that back and relive yeah. the insights. And, and maybe maybe people here in the call who have connections with the universities and colleges uh, could think about that. Um, mm. Would be really nice to have um, integration from from academia into Fuji. Yeah, sounds great. Brilliant. So thank you, everybody. Um, yeah, thanks again, Simon, for your time for joining us. And I'll, we'll catch you all again soon. Yes. Hopefully next time we can actually have an in-person judge yeah, meeting. That would be brilliant. Yeah. <laughs> we should, we should time, time it with a Manchester United match and I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we can arrange that. <laughs> brilliant. Thanks, okay, everybody. Okay, great. Thanks a lot, everybody. Bye-bye. See you later. Cheers.